playing against rogue mage in twos is like being in a boxing ring with two bears, except one of the bears has a knife and can turn invisible and the other is driving a tank that shoots fireballs at you. Today we're going to be taking a deep dive into rogue mage and show you exactly what you need to do to start winning this matchup. We were able to consult with Marrow of Skillcat EU and he gave us some inside information on how to beat rogue mage in 2v2. As you probably know by now, rogue mage is everywhere in twos and it is definitely one of the best comps in the game. According to Ludus Labs, it is the most popular comp about 1600 rating, being seen in nearly 10% of games and having an average win rate over 50%. Its matchup spread shows that its best matches are against Resto Druids and Wind Walkers, and its worst matchups are generally against Holy Paladins and Hunters. Because of its popularity, you need to have a game plan ready for winning this matchup. There are a few general tips that every comp should use against Rogue Mage and Twos. By far, the most important tip in this matchup is not letting the enemy team reset. The biggest mistake players make in this matchup is letting the rogue re-stealth, so chasing the rogue throughout the game is a huge part of beating rogue mage. Of course, with a mage spamming polymorphs and roots, it can be hard to chase down a rogue, but letting the rogue re-stealth is a massive issue. For one, re-stealthing allows them to get a high damage opener outside of Shadow Dance. Their legendary Mark of the Master Assassin will give them more damage out of stealth. Rogues also get some defensive advantages from getting a re-stealth. The Coked and Shadows Conduit allows them to remain in stealth even with damage overtimes up due to the shield it provides. On top of that, rogues sometimes play with the Soothing Darkness talent, allowing them to passively heal while stealth is active. Even if they aren't running this talent, many rogues will simply use their re-stealths to cross the map and eat mage food, restoring their entire health bar while invisible. Here we have a matchup as Resto Druid Hunter against Rogue Mage. Although Hunters are good in this matchup, Rogue Mage is a hard counter to Resto Druids. Luckily, the Druid was able to find a Rogue in the opener, but without heal overtimes on anyone, both the Druid and the Hunter could easily die. The enemy team recovers from this opener and managed to land a Polymorph on the Hunter with a blind on the Druid. This allows the Mage to start casting Greater Pyroblast, which is a common opening tactic for Rogue Mage. This cast must be stopped at all costs because it will do enormous damage even without CDs. Luckily, the polymorph ends before the cast finishes and our hunter is able to quickly disrupt the cast with an intimidation stun. The enemy team tries a weak kill attempt on the druid anyway and our druid decides to aggressively trinket and start applying pressure to the rogue. The druid's damage alone is enough to force evasion, making the rogue very vulnerable. Remember, the goal is to try and prevent the rogue from getting a re-stealth. If the rogue manages to run away and re-stealth without having to burn vanish or shadow meld, then you are giving the enemy team a free opener. By applying pressure to the rogue, you deny this free win condition from the enemy team. With enough pressure applied to the rogue and evasion ending, the druid stuns the rogue with a mighty bash. With both the mage and rogue starting to dip in HP, the game is swinging in our favor, but combustion is still available. This bash manages to force Trinket from the rogue, and with Trinket and Evasion gone, the rogue is now an easy kill target so long as the druid doesn't die. Without Trinket available, the druid is now a really good kill target. Because of this, our druid repositions far away from the mage and shifts into bear form. By being far away from the mage, you make it much harder for them to either CC or burst you. And if you notice, the mage doesn't have blink available, so it will be hard for them to connect on the druid. And as you can see, bear form in pillaring the mage has paid off. The rogue is able to get an opener and the positioning of our druid delayed burst from the mage who is now using combustion. If this kill attempt can be survived, the hunter druid team will be in excellent shape. The druid manages to survive mostly due to preemptively using bear form and this good positioning. And now that the kill attempt has been deflected, it is time to be aggressive on the rogue. As you can see, the rogue is now trying to actively get away but our druid is chasing them. Even though the hunter has forced ice block on the mage during this exchange, we still cannot let the rogue get a re-stealth. The mage, despite not having ice block, is still too tanky to kill and if the rogue gets a re-stealth, they can easily kill the druid who has no more defensives left. Chasing the rogue in this situation is extremely extremely important as the rogue does not have shadow dance available, so the only way they can get a reliable setup is to get a re-stealth opener with subterfuge. And once again, despite the mage blocking, the rogue is still the best kill target. If they get a re-stealth, the game could easily turn around. When combustion is down, you should be actively trying to chase the enemy rogue. Because combustion is the biggest win condition, you are mostly safe chasing the rogue. Try saving your interrupts for the mage's polymorphs during these moments so that the mage cannot peel for the rogue when you are chasing them. With that in mind, your main win condition is usually to kill the rogue. They are by far much squishier than mages who have Triune Ward, Ice Block, Cauterize, and even the Cryo Freeze Conduit to keep them up. Rogues have less defensives and less passive damage mitigation, so your objective should be to kill them on your second go. 
Your aim will be to survive the opener, then do a go on the rogue with a stun, trying to burn their trinket. Then, once DRs are back up and you rotate defensives for their second kill attempts, this is ideally where you should be looking to finish the game with a kill on the rogue. There are some conditions where you can kill the mage in this matchup, but only if you have an offensive dispel to get rid of their shields and ideally a way to get rid of their ice block with shattering throw or mass dispel. Otherwise, rogue is the safest kill target in this matchup. Secondly, defensive CD rotation is huge in this matchup and is something you absolutely cannot mess up. Now there isn't an optimal flowchart for how to use CDs in this matchup because of how many variables there are, so instead of going through every combination of possible defensives, try and establish some form of cooldown rotation with your partner before the game starts. Start with a set of conditions such as, if the mage uses combustion then I will trinket, or if the rogue blinds my healer, my healer will trinket. You don't want to overlap trinkets in this matchup, but instead establish a flowchart before the match starts. The most important win condition of rogue mage is combustion, so try and prioritize your biggest damage mitigation cooldown for any setup involving combustion. Remember that the cooldown of combustion can be reset with the pyrokinesis pvp talent, so ideally you should be looking to end the game before a second combustion comes back up since it will usually outpace the cooldown of your defensive cds. On top of all of this, make sure you are wearing a gladiator's emblem trinket. It will give you another defensive CD to rotate through and is super important in this matchup. Even if you are playing as double DPS, you should still think about your team's defensive rotation. One of the biggest mistakes players make is over committing to defensives in the opener against Rogue Mage. You will probably need to use some defensives in the opener, but you shouldn't use your strongest defensive unless combustion is used. Despite taking a lot of damage in the opener, our Shadow Priest only commits Trinket and Fade. Because combustion wasn't used, dispersion is not necessary. Instead, other defensive cooldowns should be rotated through first in order to save your biggest defensive for combustion. As you can see here, the rogue is committed to the kill and uses Cloak of Shadows and Shadow Blaze in order to remain aggressive. Because the priest is on stun DR, this damage is actually not that threatening as it seems. As long as our priest can line the mage, we should be alright. On top of this, because the rogue has committed Cloak, they are now really vulnerable. All we have to do is survive the rogue's cloak and blaze while line of sighting the mage. With cloak nearly over, our mage will drop super low to the rogue, but there is still one important CD to rotate through defensively, and that is the gladiator's emblem trinket, also known as Battlemaster's trinket. Here, we can see the power of Battlemaster's trinket in this matchup, as it instantly brings our priest up in HP. This allows the priest to wait out the rest of the cloak of shadows while looking for an opportunity to set up on the rogue. Using a BM trinket is essential in this matchup because it acts as a bridge for your other defensive cooldowns. It gives you one more defensive option to rotate through. If you look at the priest's HP, it is over 75% and just moments ago the priest was nearly dead. And as you will see, this intelligent defensive CD rotation pays off. Even as double DPS, you should think about how you will rotate CDs into rogue mage. Try and save your biggest CDs for combustion and use your battlemaster's trinket as an additional cooldown to keep you alive. And finally, always play your most defensive talents. You need to make sure you have enough defensives to survive their setups. Once you do this, you are more free to play aggressive. Because of this, choose the talents that are most suitable for staying alive. Before we talk about some more advanced strategy against Rogue Mage, we wanted to tell you about the amazing things we are doing over on our website, skillcaps.com wow. There, you will find a massive collection of instructional videos created by some of the best players in the world. Our videos cover everything you know to instantly increase your rating in Arena. We offer course guides and matchup tutorials to ensure that you always have the upper hand over your opponents. If you are wanting to increase your rating, or if you just want to learn more about your class in PvP, head on over to skillcaps.com wow and sign up today. Members will get instant access to all of our videos, as well as access to our premium discord where you can get support from some of the best players in the world. If you want to take your gameplay to the next level, check out skillcaps.com slash wow today. Positioning also plays a huge role in this matchup. With proper positioning, you can make it easier to defensively react to the setup from Rogue Mage. There are a lot of variables that go into proper positioning, and a lot of it depends on what comp you're playing. For most comps, it is ideal for the healer to be as far away from the mage as possible. The reason for this is that most kill setups will involve Dragon's Breath on the healer with stuns on the DPS. Setups can also start with stuns on the healer into Polymorph, but in both cases, being far away from the mage makes it significantly harder for them to CC you. If they have to cross the map to set up their CC, then they are not able to do damage. 
there are some times where it is better to stay closer to your healer and one of those situations is if you are playing with a warrior. Due to the range limitations of war banner and intervene, it is actually beneficial to be closer together to your partner. And if you are closer together, you can also soak the damage of meteor, which gets its damage split based on the number of targets it hits. But even if you aren't playing healer DPS, the principle of being as far away from the enemy mage still applies. Here, we will see an example of good positioning against rogue mage, and we will see just how important it is to pressure the rogue. Here we can see our warlock has been polymorphed, and with a sap on the fell hunter, the greater pyro cast from the mage cannot be stopped by the warlock. Luckily, our feral is able to disrupt this cast with a stun, and after they do, they use incapacitating roar to instantly shift into bear form, and in doing so, they get the rogue out of stealth. But even with the opener slightly disrupted, the rogue mage is still able to open hard on the warlock. Combustion and Meteor gets popped by the mage, and without the Feral Druid or Fell Hunter to soak the damage, our Warlock is forced to trinket and port away. Now that they're behind the pillar, they must try and avoid taking the rest of the combustion damage. The Warlock manages to land an AoE Fear on the Rogue after their Shadow Step, and they continue to line of sight the mage. Even though most of the damage has been avoided, the mage could still do some instant cast damage. And now out of line of sight of the mage, our warlock is able to free cast Unstable Affliction to start applying damage to the rogue. It is important we get as many damage over times on the rogue now, because even if they vanish to get away, we are still on stun DR, so we are safe for the meantime. On top of that, the rogue conduit that gives them a shield during stealth has a damage cap, meaning it can only absorb so much damage before it breaks, which means applying multiple damage over times will increase its chance of breaking early. The rogue is forced to burn a trinket and vanish in order to get away and try and reset, and while still on stun DR, our warlock positions toward the center of the map, creating a triangle position between the mage and his pharaoh. And as you can see, our damage over times did their job at breaking the rogue out of stealth. We now have really good positioning where we are max distance from the enemy mage and rogue, while still being in line of sight of our partner in order to support each other. And now, our warlock continues with this perfect positioning by using the far pillar as line of sight from the rogue and mage, dodging in and out of line of sight to apply damage over times. Now that the warlock is off stun DR and BM trinket is unavailable, they are still a potential kill target. But by staying out of line of sight of both the rogue and the mage, they are preventing a shadow step from the rogue and possibly a dragon's breath sheep from the mage. Now that their kill options are limited, the rogue mage are forced to panic blind the feral druid. And once this blind ends, the rogue mage commit to a panic kill attempt on the feral, who has saved their trinket up to this point. After trinketing the stun, the feral is able to get a full rake stun on the rogue, all while the warlock maintains proper defensive positioning. And as you can see, this positioning completely changed the course of this game, and scored a win for the warlock team. And once you have proper positioning, you can then get better at preemptively using defensive cooldowns to deny their win conditions. Rogue Mage kill setups are incredibly telegraphed, meaning that if you are able to disrupt their win conditions before they happen, you are usually in a really strong position. Rogue Mage kill setups are incredibly telegraphed, meaning that if you are able to disrupt their win conditions before they happen, you are usually in a really strong position. You can do this by preemptively using CDs on their setups. For instance, if you see the enemy mage DB sheeping your partner, you know that they are probably not the kill target. And if you aren't locked down by the rogue while this is happening, you can use CDs before you get stunned or CC'd to completely deny their go. Here we can see the rogue mage trying to get an opener against priest warrior, but the warrior is staying close to the priest. If the priest gets sapped, the warrior will instantly bladestorm to try and deny stuns on themselves. And once the mage gets revealed, the warrior instantly bladestorms and follows this up with an intimidating shout, denying their entire opener. Now with both mage and rogue CC, the priest and warrior can get a clean setup onto the rogue. With this disrupted opener, they start applying pressure to the rogue. The rogue is put into a full stormbolt at the same time a chastise lands onto the mage. Under all of this pressure, the rogue is forced to trinket and evasion. As you can see, by preemptively using CDs and disrupting the opener, the enemy team was immediately able to turn around pressure and now are in a great position to win the game. This pressure also winds up forcing vanish from the rogue and pushes the rogue all the way across the map to eat. Now with one setup out of the way, the warrior team just needs to survive one more setup to kill the rogue, who is now missing all of their major defensive cooldowns. The mage is under some pressure from the warrior, and because they have both Shattering Throw and Mass Dispel, they are actually a good kill target. Our rogue moves into the enemy team, and in a really strong preemptive play, the priest uses Greater Fade. This will disrupt any CC on them and allow the warrior to continue pressuring the mage. The rogue is forced to wait out the Greater Fade, 
and then in another great preemptive defensive play, the warrior drops a war banner. This war banner will disrupt the opener after fade ends and allow him to continue pressure on the mage. To make matters worse for the rogue mage, the warrior lands a disarm on the rogue, delaying the ability of the rogue to kill the war banner. And on top of that, the moment the priest gets put into CC, the warrior instantly uses Die by the Sword to finish shutting down this gill from the enemy team. And now with Die by the Sword active and Ignore Pain up, the warrior has completely shut down this gill, despite the priest being stuck in polymorphs. And now right on schedule, without Trinket available, the rogue is put into a full stun from the priest. This is now the time for the enemy team to finish the rogue. With absolutely nothing left, the rogue is put into a second stun from the warrior. At the same time, a polymorph is reflected onto the mage. As you can see, preemptively using defensive ZDs against rogue mage can be really strong. If you're able to predict their openers, you can completely deny their setups by using CDs before you are put into CC. Finally, there is one talent that some rogues use in twos that actually has some interesting outplay and can be used to predict the rogue's positioning and openers. Dagger in the Dark is a PvP talent that is often used with rogue one-shot builds. This talent puts a stacking debuff on targets within 20 yards while the rogue is stealth. This debuff will cause targets to take 10% increased damage from the next shadow strike, stacking up to 10 times. With this in mind, this talent is useful for tracking the rogue's location while in stealth. If you see the debuff increasing on yourself, you know the rogue must be close. If you see the debuff falling on you but increasing on your partner, you know the rogue must be closer to your partner. With this knowledge, you can predict who the rogue will open on and when they will open. In this game, pay close attention to the dagger in the dark stacks on the party frames of the druid and the warrior. As you can see, a stack of dagger in the dark has recently applied to the warrior, and the two stacks of the debuff have not been reapplied to the druid in the last 5 seconds. As the druid repositions away from the warrior, you can see that the warrior continues to gain stacks, while the druid is losing both of their stacks. This means that the rogue is now far away from the druid but close to the warrior. Because of this, the druid makes sure to keep heal overtimes rolling on his warrior. If the druid were to start gaining stacks, it would mean the rogue is close, usually indicating that a stun is going to happen on the druid. And if we skip ahead a bit, you can see that the druid starts gaining stacks of the debuff while the warrior starts losing them. With this in mind, that means that a stun is likely incoming on the druid. On top of that, the warrior is now stuck in the polymorph, further indicating that the druid will be swapped to. To prepare for this, the druid starts casting fleshcraft, denying the cheap shot from the rogue and gaining a shield while the mage is still out of line of sight. And as you can see, the dagger in the dark debuff can be used to easily tell where the rogue is positioned relative to you and your partner. If you're able to monitor its stacks, you can better predict when the rogue will open on and what target they will stun. And there you have it. As a recap, against rogue mage, your main priority should be stopping the rogue from re-stealthing. Usually the rogue is the best kill target, and try and set up your main win condition by stunning them without a trinket. Focus on rotating defensive CDs, making sure to play with Battlemaster's trinket and your most defensive talents. If you manage to do all of this, you will have a much better shot at beating this comp.